Welcome back. Today in part three on Arctic climate, I examine the connection between how the sun heats the oceans and how the oceans heat the Arctic from decades to millennia. Now, the tropics receive more than twice the solar energy as the Arctic does, heating tropical ocean surface temperatures to about 30 degrees centigrade or 86 Fahrenheit. In the contrast, polar regions warm only to about negative 2 degrees centigrade or 28 Fahrenheit. Thus, the tropics serve as a reservoir of heat for the polar regions. Now, some researchers believe that sunspot cycles have affected the climate change, but solar energy emitted during sunspot cycles varies by only about plus or minus 1.3 watts per meter squared. So most agree that small amounts of energy is not enough to now warm the earth from the cold depths of the Little Ice Age that lasted from about 1300 to 1850 AD, leading some scientists to ill-advisedly dismiss the sun's role in climate change. Alternatively, the greater amount of energy from increasing greenhouse infrared energy suggested it is rising CO2 that has been warming the earth, but there are also problematic inconsistencies with their hypotheses. For example, although it is claimed the oceans are absorbing 90% of the CO2 greenhouse energy, unlike solar energy, greenhouse infrared rays penetrate less than the width of a human hair into the ocean's surface. So other dynamics affecting the ocean heating must be considered. As we will see, despite low energy differences, Sunspots do affect temperatures by altering critical dynamics governing global heat distribution. Furthermore, solar and greenhouse radiative energy are not the only sources heating the Earth's surface. Changing sea ice cover either insulates or ventilates huge amounts of stored solar energy in the ocean. Peer-reviewed studies have documented that the Arctic heat released can vary from 10 watts per meter squared through 3 meter thick ice to 700 watts per meter squared through newly formed thin ice. Such heat ventilation easily explains why the Arctic air temperatures have warmed much faster than elsewhere in the world. All scientists agree that heat is being transported from the tropics to the Arctic. Here the blue line shows that average amount of solar heat that's absorbed by tropical oceans is about 300 plus watts per meter squared. The red line shows much less of that absorbed heat is radiated away in it, from the tropics. The difference between incoming and outgoing radiated heat is labeled surplus, indicating that the surplus heat must have been exported out of the tropics by ocean and atmosphere currents. Now, the difference between the solar heat absorbed in the Arctic and the much greater amount of heat that's radiated away from the Arctic is labeled the deficit. It is the inflow of solar heated tropical water that accounts for that deficit. As described in part one, how transport of tropical ocean heat causes an overestimation of the global average temperature, I showed via a very simple experiment how global warming average is greatly biased by this heat transport into the Arctic in its subsequent release. To describe the different critical dynamics of heat transport into the Arctic, the analogy of a residential water system is useful. Dynamics that affect the surplus heat in the ocean reservoir are referred to as tropical factors. But like your home's faucets, subpolar factors control how much tropical heat enters the Arctic Ocean. For this analysis of Arctic climate change, I'll limit the video to changes in the Northern Atlantic. One critical subpolar effect controls how much heated water arriving via the Gulf Stream continues into the Arctic versus how much is recycled in the subtropical gyre back towards the equator. One critical tropical effect controls how much warm southern hemisphere waters are directed across the equator to the Gulf Stream. The sun plays a role in both factors. 
The sun and the tilt of the Earth's axis conspire to pump various amounts of warm water into the Arctic between seasons and between cold glacial periods and warm interglacials. In recent times, the Earth's axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees and always points to the North Star. But it will point to other stars during a 23,000 year Milankovitch cycle called precession. The Earth's orbit around the Sun also varies from circular to elliptical, in another Milankovitch cycle lasting 100,000 years. Currently, the Earth is farthest from the Sun during our Northern Hemisphere summer. Nonetheless, it is our warmest season due to the tilt of the axis. Without a tilt, the Sun's warmest rays would strike the equator, as happens now only during each spring and autumn equinox. However, due to the tilt, the axis points our northern hemisphere towards the sun during summer, having caused the warmest solar heating to move northwards to the Tropic of Cancer, 23.5 degrees north of the equator. And due to the resulting effects on the winds, most tropical heat is also drawn towards the Arctic. The tilt also puts Arctic Circle in full sunlight, but the Antarctic in full darkness. During our winter, the axis points away from the sun, so the warmest solar heating happens over the Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and a half degrees south of the equator. The flow of the warm ocean water into the northern hemisphere dwindles, and despite being closer to the sun, we experience winter and the Arctic descends into full darkness and a rapid increase in new sea ice. But the axis tilt also changes with the third Milankovitch cycle called obliquity. The axis tilt will cycle between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees every 41,000 years, with surprisingly major ice age effects. The glacial maximum of the last ice age ended as an increasing tilt also increased the flow of warm Atlantic waters into the Arctic. The warmest period of the interglacial called the Holocene Optimum, happened during maximum obliquity, coinciding with maximum warm Atlantic inflows. As the axis tilt then cycled back to a lesser tilt, increasingly less Atlantic water entered the Arctic, and accordingly Arctic sea ice gradually increased, and temperatures cooled in what scientists call the neoglacial. Now, scientists have published about a related and re relevant scientific conundrum. Over the past 6,000 years of a declining tilt, as sea ice increased and reached its greatest extent and thickness during the cold Little Ice Age from 1300 to 1815 AD, yet during that time, there was a slight uptick in CO2 concentrations. Thus, it's odd that some clients climate scientists with a more catastrophic view of climate change believe rising CO2 will prevent further cooling that has been knowingly attributed to declining obliquity, a decline that will continue for the next 10,000 years. Where the Earth is the warmest, the Intertropical Convergence Zone, or ITCZ, forms. The warm zone forms uh, a low pressure zone that draws in the winds and the ocean currents from the north and the south, where they converge, causing the air to rise. Sailors back in Columbus's day were stranded in the ITCZ because it was windless, it was a windless patch that they called the doldrums. Today we see the location of the ITCZ from satellite pictures as a narrow band of clouds encircling the Earth. However, although the ITC shifts northward and south with the seasons, its location does not strictly adhere to the location of the sun's greatest heating. During our summer, the, uh, the June ITCC only shifts 9 to 10 degrees north, and this is partly due to the mixing with cooler waters. During our winter, the January ITCZ barely shifts south of the equator over the oceans, 
And because the land heats faster than the ocean, the ITCZ more closely follows the sun's position over South America. So on average, the ITCZ remains between two and nine degrees north of the equator, drawing warm tropical southern hemisphere waters across the equator to amplify warm waters reaching the Gulf Stream. Now the shape of South America also affects how much warm water gets pumped towards the Arctic. The eastern point of Brazil serves as a divider that can that direct more warm water north or south. When the ITCZ is north of the equator, as it is today, it also shifts the trade winds in the ocean's warmest currents northwards, above the Brazilian divider, guiding more warm water towards the Gulf Stream. This tropical effect factor warms the North Atlantic. Furthermore, the northern location of the ITCZ has a subpolar effect, causing the North Atlantic high pressure system to shift northwards so that its clockwise circulation guides more Gulf Stream and North Atlantic current waters into the Arctic. During cooler periods, like the last ice age or the recent little ice age, colder northern temperatures cause the ITCZ to shift southwards. This tropical factor causes more warm currents to be deflected southward by Brazil, cooling the North Atlantic. The high pressure system also shifts southward with a subpolar effect that recirculates more warm water back towards the equator. With less warm water intruding the Arctic, the Arctic is cooler. Now, a group of Scandinavian scientists recently formed the Barents Sea Ice Edge Project, analyzing the past 400 plus years of varying sea ice in inflows of Atlantic water. One of the primary factors affecting the Barents Sea's southern ice edge was correlated with sunspot cycles. Despite insignificant changes in solar heating, the increase in the number of sunspots increases the effect of solar winds on the Earth's magnetic fields. Stronger magnetic fields slows the rotation of the Earth, which then affects the eastward momentum of the ocean's current. During low sunspot periods, such as the Dalton Minimum in the early 1800s, the Earth's rotation sped up, causing a stronger westward momentum for the North Atlantic current, which reduced warm water inflows into the Arctic seen as yellow, and redirecting warm waters eastward, seen in more orange. During high sunspot years of our 20th century, a stronger magnetic effect slowed rotation and allowed more warm water to intrude into the Arctic. During the Maunder Minimum of the late 1600s, less warm water entered the Arctic and simultaneously warmer water and moisture was diverted towards the southern Europe. This caused a peak in Swiss glacier growth across the Alps, threatening Swiss mountain villages and even engulfing some in ice. Now, it wasn't colder Swiss temperatures that prompted that glacier growth. It was the greater supply of moisture that also coincided with higher lake levels at lower elevations. Likewise, other peer-reviewed studies have correlated sunspot changes in intruding Atlantic water and changes in Barents Sea Ice. When sunspot numbers were high, rotation slows, and inflows increased and sea ice extent dropped. When sunspot numbers dropped, sea ice grew as inflows were reduced. The effects of sunspots on the Earth's rotation also agrees with independent length of day studies. The longer the length of day in the 1970s correlates with a stronger sunspot cycle 21. A shorter length of day and thus faster rotation correlates with the reduced solar winds of the sunspot cycle 24. 
So why hasn't the Arctic sea ice grown during this decade if a faster rotation deflects warmer water from the Arctic? So some suggest the failure of sea ice to increase despite falling sunspots should be expected due to the predicted CO2 warming. But CO2-based predictions have also failed. For example, published in the 2012 Guardian, Arctic sea ice expert Dr. Walheim predicted accelerating sea ice loss and the complete loss of summer sea ice by 2016 as CO2 concentration rise. But no such thing has happened. On the other hand, Dr. Solheim's prediction of an extreme drop in the Svalbard's temperatures by 2020, based on sunspot effects and reduced Atlantic water inflows, has also failed to materialize. Both failed predictions illustrate why it's dangerous to predict sea ice extent based on only one or two variables. However, the rapid decline in sea ice extent that once prompted alarmist dire climate change predictions has now leveled off since 2007, revealing that dynamics stronger than CO2 warming are also in play. For 30 years, natural climate oscillations in their warm phase have offset predicted sunspot cooling effects and aligned with CO2 warming predictions. But those oscillations are now shifting to colder phases. So the next decade will determine whether or not the current leveling off of sea ice extent is signaling the beginning of a return to increasing sea ice. So up next, part four will be how natural climate oscillations affect the Arctic climate. And until then, embrace the renowned scientist Thomas Huxley's advice that skepticism is the highest of duties and blind faith the one unpardonable sin. And if you appreciate the science clearly presented here, science rarely presented by mainstream media, then please give it a like, Share it or copy the URL and email the video or subscribe to my YouTube channel or read my book, Landscapes and Cycles, An Environmentalist Journey to Climate Skepticism. Thank you.